Well, let's see here. I think what we have to do is think in terms of the exhaustion of our own cultural forms. I mean, that's what we're living through, is a global dying created by the exhaustion of our cultural forms and the vitality of the cultural forms that we see uh, in these so-called primitive, I call them preliterate, people. As Nicole pointed out, they have nothing but what they seem to have that we cannot seem to get a grip on is a kind of dynamic equilibrium with their environment and peace of mind in the felt experience of the moment. These are the two things we don't have. As a society, we cannot seem to make peace with nature. As human beings, as individuals, it's very hard for us to be at peace with ourselves. I mean, uh, I consider my own life uh, uh, the search for peace of mind. Forget enlightenment, forget shunyata, all this stuff. You know, just a little peace of mind would be uh, a tremendous boon as far as I can see. So I, I th really think that there's a confluence here of themes and possibilities. It has this richly plotted uh, texture that always lets you know that you're in the presence of... Uh, a higher order of things. It's that the shamans whom we admire, who we idealize, are seen to be at the center of this environment, the warm jungle, the tropics, the warm tropics, that we find it necessary to destroy. So it's a perfect image of us being at war not only with ourselves, but with nature itself. And, uh, you know, for you've heard all about how the Amazon and the Congo Basin and eastern Indonesia are all being cleared and lumbered and uh, turned into cattle ranches. This is a tragedy, obviously. We understand and can perceive the dynamics of that. But how to make sense of a situation where as the World Bank and the IMF attempt to halt this kind of destruction, on the other side of the coin, uh, the United States State Department and the DEA and these agencies propose and are planning to carry out the defoliation of the Wajaga Basin. So there's a schizophrenia here that is not academic, I mean, are we trying to get the patient well or are we pulling the plugs one by one? We seem to be acting in both dimensions simultaneously. And I think it's because we have not in this culture awakened to the depth of the crisis that surrounds us. You know, there's a lot of uh, kind of self-congratulatory backslapping going around these days over the fact that communists everywhere are in hot water and have to admit that they did it wrong. And this gives a lot of satisfaction to uh, people who feel that that means we did it right. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it right. They did it wrong and now admit they did it wrong. We do it wrong and have yet to even raise the possibility of turning away from what we are doing. The internal contradictions of Marxism were based on a false definition of what people are. People do not respond to central planning, hortatory propaganda, and stereotyping. Neither do people respond uh, to uh, an, etho an ethos of self-denial or a view of human beings that denies the fact that we have certain itches which must be scratched. So, you know, I think that the collapse of Marxism is only the collapse of the outer edge of the societal and civilizing assumptions that we have made. After all, Marxism is nothing more than the millenarian uh, retread of Christian millenarianism. 
and so is modern science, yet another secular retread of Christian millenarianism. So our culture is in trouble, not trouble. We are at a terminal crisis, a bifurcation that is, it can only go one of two ways, horror beyond your wildest imagination or breakthrough to dignity, decency, community, and caring beyond your wildest imagination. Now, where do you look for models? Where do you go? The answer is so obvious. You go to nature. Nature has been playing this game for three billion years on this planet. We have been playing the game, we, the apostles of Christian scientism, for about 2,000 <laughs> years. Nature has an economy, an elegance, a style that if we could but emulate it, we could rise out of the rubble that we are making of the planet. You know, it was the geographer Carl Sauer who said, man found the planet a climaxed primeval forest. He, and notice the gender here, he will leave the planet a weedy lot. A weedy lot. Well, now this is a metaphor where you change climaxed rainforest for weeds, but it's also true. By clearing land, we promote the kind of plant evolution that stresses very rapid seed production and annular cycles of growth. In other words, weeds. And this tendency to find perfection and then to leave rubble in our wake has haunted us for the past three or four thousand years of our history. Now with the ozone shield disappearing, with acid rain falling on the earth that can melt blocks of marble, with the CO2 levels rising, uh, with the levels of strontium and uh, chlorofluorocarbons, and you know the litany. We have now one last chance to fish or cut bait. And the place where nature has provided the models for how to respond to this situation is the climaxed rainforest. Only the climaxed tropical rainforest has the kind of complexity of signal transfer, uh, uh, movement of nutritional materials, movement of electromagnetic radiation that we find in the modern city. It is a cliche of modernity that the city is a jungle. The problem is it isn't jungle enough. And I think it's the task of the new shamans to take the metaphor of the jungle, which is a metaphor of tremendous uh, wealth, tremendous variety, trem a tremendous outpouring of form and of energy and of uh, potential fulfillment of various bifurcation patterns of flow, to take that and in, enrich our own lives with it. And the way this is done is by empowering the, the presence of experience. The main thing that you get with these so-called uh, primitive, preliterate people and with people like Nicole, who have spent time in this situation, is they are in the moment. They know how to have fun. They know how to work. They know how to live. And the reason they understand this is because they are focused within the confines of the felt presence of experience. They do not live by abstraction. And abstraction is the knife poised at our hearts. We are so much the victims of abstraction that with the earth in flames, we can barely rouse ourselves to wander across the room and look at the thermostat. That's the level of disimpassioning that abstraction has laid upon us. Well, hopefully this weekend there will be passion. Um, there will be uh, an effort wherever there is abstraction to drag it down into the felt presence of the moment. I think basically what we are are a kind of green anarchy. 
an effort to revivify social forms that have been atrophied in the West at least since the destruction of Eleusis, probably in most places thousands of years before that. This is our last chance. I have done the best I could uh, in terms of trying to sift through all these options and as a communicator offer the best way out. And, you know, I could only do my best. And so that's what you get. I can't preach scientism because I don't believe in it. I can't preach Buddhism because I can't understand it. <laughs> the only thing I can preach is the felt presence of immediate experience, which for me came through the psychedelics, which are not drugs, but plants. It's a perversion of language to try and derail this thing into talk of drugs. There are spirits in the natural world that come to us in this way. And uh, so far as I can tell, this is the only way that they come to us that is uh, rapid enough for it to have an impact upon us as a global population. This weekend will be different because we will be hewing close to the source. Uh, Nicole is a priceless repository of information, more even than she knows. If I could declare her a national treasure, I, I would. Uh, the number, who, who knows what this woman knows? Who knows how much human suffering, the alleviation of how much anxiety uh, lies in the hands of perhaps half a dozen people? of Nicole's caliber who have paid their dues in these jungles. This information is flowing through our fingers and disappearing in another 30 years. It will be all gone. Every time I go to the Amazon, I can feel the way in which it's slipping away. When my brother and I go off looking for these unusual hallucinogens, often we have the experience where when we finally find the person who claims they know what we're after, the line goes like this. Well, I've never taken it, but as a child I remember seeing my grandfather prepare it, and I think I can do it. If it weren't for us standing there, asking that it be done, it would never have even risen into the gentleman's mind as a possibility. This is the knife edge upon which this knowledge is poised. If it can be saved, it gives me hope that we can be saved. If we can't save this kind of knowledge, uh, we cannot save ourselves, because this kind of knowledge is ourselves. Culture is a garment which you put on. Medical systems are pieces of jewelry which you wrap around your throat or neck. Religious ideals are like objects which you push through pierced nostrils and earlobes. If we cannot come to terms with that which allows us to give birth with ease, to die with dignity, and to live in health, then what kind of a future do we have? No future at all. So this is not a meeting of obscurantists or enthusiasts for some private vista of transcendence. This is a meeting of political activists, people who are socially committed to themselves, to each other, to the larger idea of community, and who understand that when you talk about Gaia, it's only an abstraction unless you talk about plants. The division uh, between uh, uh, the masculine and the feminine is only trivially a difference between men and women. It is fundamentally a division between plants and animals. Plants are the enveloping feminine matrix of control and refurbishment Animals are something invented by plants to move seeds around. <laughs> An extremely yang solution to a peculiar problem which they faced. So the archaic revival, if it means anything, it means reconnecting the Gaian mind, which is a vegetable mind, 
a feminine, enfolding, boundary-dissolving, planetary mind that is not an abstraction, not a stereotype, not something used to create hortatory uh, propaganda, but a living, breathing reality, a reality which is the only thing which stands between us and Armageddon. History is a kind of horrified realization that something has been lost, that there is a, an itch hard to scratch in the civilized context, that we have, out of fear, really, descended into patterns of domination of each other, of the environment, of our children, of our social relations with exogamous groups, we have descended into a dominator pattern that is basically based on clutching, on fear. And I'm sure most of you have heard me argue that this is the consequence of ceasing basically to do enough hallucinogens in the diet, that in fact, what human beings were flirting with over many, many tens of millennia, let's say from 100,000 years ago to 15,000 years ago, human beings were in a flirtatious situation with a symbiotic relationship with this mind resident in vegetable nature. Now, you all know that what classic symbiosis is in biology. It's where, let's take the, the example of the little fish who lives in the sea anemone, and big fish don't bother it. It gains protection. The sea anemone gains access to larger prey, which come to investigate the little fish. That kind of symbi symbiosis is genetically locked in. And if you take the little fish away from the uh, anemone and put it, let us say, in an aquarium without anemones, it doesn't die. It doesn't go into an immediate physiological crisis. No, what happens is it simply has a low body weight and a short lifespan. In other words, it is under stress. And I believe, I, I hope I'm not deluding myself, but I, I believe that the lost secret of human emergence, the, the undefined catalyst that took a very bright monkey and turned that species into a tormented, self-reflecting poet dreamer, that catalyst has to be sought in these uh, tertiary alkaloids in the food chain that were catalyzing higher states of uh, intellectual activity. And I've pointed out to you uh, ad nauseum, I'm sure, the reciprocal feedback relationship that was working there uh, in the case of the mushroom in the Velt situation in Africa it was promoting at low doses visual acuity, which was feeding back into the hunting and gathering process, making those uh, animals with this increased, increased visual acuity more adaptively successful, hence more reproductively successful, hence they're outbreeding their competitors. Uh, at higher doses, psilocybin actually causes a generalized arousal, which includes sexual arousal. Again, it becomes a catalyst for increased reproductive success. More instances of copulation in a situation like that lead to more successful births of those into family structures where the alkaloid has been accepted into the food chain. Well. Uh, this would be only an obscure topic of interest to primatologists were it not for the fact that it is a crisis in consciousness which confronts us globally. Consciousness is the commodity that if we do not have enough of it, do not produce it fast enough,
then the momentum of the processes we set in motion in our ignorance is going to sterilize the planet and uh, do us all in. So we have to have consciousness. Well, then you look at the smorgasbord of ethnographic possibilities and you discover this institution of shamanism. It is the institution of planner, of visionary, of manager, of large system coordinator. That's what it's about. You call it magic on one level. You call it curing. You call it um, folk psychiatry or uh, weather prediction. Shamans have been involved in all of these things. But as Nicole was made so eloquently the point last night, to these deep forest people, it is ordinary. It is ordinary. They live in a different cultural dimension than we do. Dimensions which to us are completely value dark are to them completely transparent. And dimensions which to us are extremely rich and complex the inner world of the nucleus of the atom, let us say, are for them totally value dark. They don't even cognize the possibility of asking the question. But nevertheless, the specialization in these, very doma in these various domains is not something where uh, one is as good as another. Consciousness is the domain of immediate experience. How are we going to save this planet? How are we going to take the lethal cascade of toxic, technological, and ignorance-producing habits that are loose on this planet and channel them toward some kind of a sane and livable world? Well, the answer is emerging in culture out of the collectivity of global consciousness. It is what I call the archaic revival. It is this very large turnover in the mass mind. Some people call it a paradigm shift. It's an effort to recover the sensory ratios, the feelings, and the attitudes of 15 to 20,000 years ago, before fear, before ego, before male dominance, before hierarchy, hoarding, warfare, propaganda, child abuse, all of these things. Uh, and the answer lies, as was indicated last night, in integration into the dynamics of nature. Well, so far as I, my analysis gives it to me, uh, the only way you can abandon yourself to the dynamics of nature is to break through the language shell. You must cut through the um, aura of programming and cultural assumptions that surround us from the moment we are able to speak. The only way this can be done is by dissolving the boundaries of ego. Ego is a structure that is erected by a neurotic individual who is a member of a neurotic culture against the facts of the matter. And culture, which we put on like an overcoat, culture is the collectivized consensus about what sort of neurotic behaviors are acceptable. <laughs> now, I don't know... So, you see, what I see going on in the Amazon is a very radical psycholytic therapy where they are dissolving, literally dissolving, the boundaries of self, culture, and, uh, and ego assumption. And then what you discover is not the white light or what William James called a blooming, buzzing confusion, although in the first few minutes it can be like that, but what you really discover is sentient, organized, living, loving nature. That nature is a force. Nature is a mind, a personality, organized with intentionality, organized with uh, feeling, humor, grace, and uh, 
conviction, conviction. And if you can get right with that conviction, then that's the secret of dancing in the waterfall. That's the secret of the shaman's apparent transcendence of the rules of mundane statistics. Because that is what it is. The shaman doesn't violate physics. He just, he or she simply knows how to push the improbable to its greatest extent. And uh, in, in Eastern philosophy, this is called the Tao. You know, abandonment to the flow. A fitting of the small pattern into the larger pattern. Well, I think these things are very important because I think uh, that psychology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, it's a good idea, but it will never reach any kind of operational effectiveness until we look to these native healers all over the world and study their methods, and their methods are uh, chemical and personal. It's a combination of care, attention, intention, and chemistry that allows consciousness to be made malleable and then recast uh, in other forms. So, uh, I find myself this weekend explaining myself. That's what I feel like I'm doing. Why does someone who extols the self-transforming elf machines of the DMT space also claim to be a conservationist, also, you know, have a mathematical dog and poodle show. Well, it's because all of these things emerge out of the concrescence of consciousness, its intention toward its own transformation. Nature is the answer. Not, it's not enough to be like Wordsworth. It's not enough to... Uh, this is not, you know, Mao Zedong said the revolution is not a dinner party. And certainly the ecological revolution is not a dinner party. Poetic sensitivity to the death of the planet is not what we're striving for here. What we're striving for is to halt, overturn, and back out of the impending death of the planet. It is very clear now that consciousness will decide that the planet, there are not rosy futures of uh, suburban housing and ratatouille to be extended endlessly into the future. We are approaching a bifurcation where it is either going to become heaven or hell.